I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm good. I'm not. I'm not. Good morning. It's good to see y'all here this morning. Let's all stand as we get ready to start our worship service. First one is standing on the promises. service. Guys, it is good to be here, and I'm going to tell you what, I am so excited because our COVID numbers are down below the uh, kids can go to school threshold, so this Wednesday night we will be back at a full schedule. Uh, Wednesday night we'll be running buses, bringing kids into service. We'll have class here. I won't have to preach to empty tables. That is so depressing to sit and talk to nobody. Uh, really excited to be able to do that. So this Wednesday, that means next Sunday, we'll also be on full schedule. Uh, Sunday school, kids classes, uh, normal message. So unless something changes, that's our plan. So Sunday school teachers, be ready. And I'm sure you are so thankful to see uh, our family back together. Miss Tracy's back with us, feeling a little better. Uh, be praying, though, today for Miss Linda Lewis's mother. She took a fall last night, had a compound fracture. 
went to the hospital and because of her health there's been some complications difficulties with blood pressures and things the surgery this morning went well but really be praying for the recovery process still a lot in question um, as far as her, her, her foot goes so please be praying uh, for that good to report that Steve's son Stephen is home uh, I forgot to ask if he was one that got to sleep in the parking garage or not but uh, it won't hurt him even if he was army men are tough uh, but uh, be praying, continue to pray for Steve's grandson. We sent that request out. Um, man, it sounds like the report was a little better than expected, but he is on medicines and some things, so continue to pray for him. Uh, I hope that you're reading with us through the Old Testament. This week we were just blessed to get to read the entire story of Joseph. And for the next four weeks, that's what we're going to talk about in our sermons, is this story of this incredible man of God named Joseph. In all of our scripture, he's the one man that I can think of outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't have a bad thing to say about him. We don't see any failures in his life. We don't see any yielding. So he's a great man of God to study. This week's memory verse is John 1, 4. So now that you've been sitting, let's stand and let's say our memory verses together. I hope that you can, without looking at the screen, say at least the first two, hopefully through number three, and then we will recite four together. Let's just say it all in one big group. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Good job. Here's our new one. John 1, 4. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Such strong truths that we're memorizing together. You'll be surprised how often when you're witnessing with somebody and they have questions about who Jesus is, how often you're going to turn to what we're memorizing together this year. So I hope you will do that with us. In our reading coming up, we're going to be in the life of Moses, watching Pharaoh uh, have to let the children of Israel go and that great deliverance. So I hope you'll read that with us this week, Exodus 4 to 21. Let's pray and let's continue our worship service together this morning. God, we are so thankful that, Father, you are good. God, you love us so well that, Father, your grip on us is eternal, God. We can never leave your protection. We can never leave the safety of being in the hands of our Father. God, we thank you for Christ, his gift to us on the cross, whereby we can be saved. And, God, we've came to make much of that today, God, to sing the praises of the cross and your gift Father, we do pray for those in our church that are still suffering from some of the effects of COVID. Thank you, God, for bringing our whole congregation through, God, that your mighty hand was on each and every one. And, Father, we pray that you would continue to guide, that, God, you would continue to guard. Father, we pray this morning uh, for Linda's mama. We pray, God, that in your, with your mighty hand, Father, you would oversee her recovery and that, God, you would... Uh, aid and assist. Thank you, God, for the surgery this morning. Against odds, Father, you, you allowed it to be successful. So, Father, we lift her to you, and we pray, God, that you would keep her. Father, we pray for Steve's grandson, that you would continue to show yourself mighty in his life, that you would heal, Father, that, God, you would be his protector and his provider. Father, we pray for our service today. God, thank you for our church. Thank you for this faith family. Thank you, God, that we are gathered around the one holy word of God, the infallible, inerrant word of God. God, that our bonds of fellowship are based on our adherence to that word, that our doctrine, Father, is based on that word. God, we pray that you'd be glorified in our service, Father. We pray that you would speak to hearts from your word today, and that, God, we would, we would leave encouraged today, having learned about Joseph. God, be honored in our service. Accept these songs as an offering of praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's remain standing as we do our next song. If you ever wondered what we believe in, this is the name of this song. This I Believe.
Jesus, our Savior. I believe in God, our Father. I believe in Christ, the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. Jesus 
Genesis chapter 37, please. Genesis chapter 37. And for the next four weeks, uh, we want to look at this life of Joseph. As we read Joseph's life, one thing that is certain is that his entire life could be uh, marked by the word uncertainty. Made sense for Joseph. Nothing ever. Uh, worked out the way it was supposed to. But if you read this week, and I pray that you did, and if you did not read this week, I would encourage you to start in about Genesis 29 and finish the book of Genesis this week. Read this story, because today we're going to cover nine chapters. So Miss Dot's been back in the back making coffee for everybody. Uh, we're going to do some finger sandwiches. And no, no, she didn't. She did not do that. No, we are going to look through. Uh, we are going to look through nine chapters today. So we're not going to read it all. You're going to miss a lot of this great story as we just look at highlights from different parts. So I do pray you'll read through this because uh, his whole life. I remember one time my girls wanted to go to the movies and they wanted to watch this movie that they called Lemony Snickets. And I'm like, what's a Lemony Snicket? And she said, well, it's also called a series of unfortunate events. And this whole movie, nothing goes right, but it leads to this great ending. And that's kind of Joseph's life. The whole life is one big series of unfortunate events that leads to this great deliverance for not just him and his family, but for the whole nation of Israel. It is incredible. And we get to see through his uncertain life, God's sovereignty over nations, God's sovereignty over his people and how he uses and twists everything just so to make his plan come about. It's an inspiration for believers of all times as we all face uncertainty in our lives. I know we've all maybe asked God, God, I don't know what you're doing right now. This hurts. This is painful. This is unfair, God. Why are you doing this? And you know, Joseph had the right to ask the same question. But through his life, we get to see how God uses, no matter what happens to us, and no matter where we're from, and, and, and no matter where the unchangeable situations in life, these things outside our control, no matter where they drag us, God's still in control. And as his believers, we can lay our head down every night, be it in a bed, be it in a parking garage, we can lay our head down and go, God, you got me. You're my father. I'm your son. I'm your daughter. 
And listen, not only will he use all of this instability to stretch us, to grow us, to provide for us, he'll even use it to honor his own name. See, for the next four weeks, I want to dig into this life, and I want to look at different aspects of his life, and just to encourage us to face our own uncertainties, how to, how to stand strong with faith and with character and with trust like Joseph does. And listen, because the only thing that we know for certain today is we stand and we sit where we are today is we have no idea what tomorrow is going to bring. We have no idea what's coming down the pipe. And you know, it doesn't matter who's in politics or who's in government. or We never know what's coming down the pipe, do we? I'd have never imagined in a million years we'd be having church in an old gas station. Did you? Never planned it. Never thought it would happen. I never thought I'd be recording messages on a Wednesday night and putting them on Facebook and we can have church. And you know why I do that? I literally do that so that I can say hi to y'all when y'all come in because if we do it live, I can't see you. And I'd rather see you. I'd rather know you're there. Uh, my, my cousin uh, from New Jersey was on this week watching Wednesday night service. And, and you're going, God, it's uncertain. But look at how you're using it for your glory. Look at how you're using it in ways we would have never predicted. So I want to look at Joseph's life and get this, that, that, that God is always in control and we can just trust him. Uh, today, I want to look at a s- specific part of Joseph's life, and that is where he comes from. I want us to look that and see that his determination and his great character actually came from a family of dysfunction. Joseph's life, I mean, if I had to put one word over his, his father and even his grandfather and his brothers and his sibling, his household, it would be this dysfunction. Joseph came from the worst family that, that, that I believe is in our Bible anywhere, pagan or believer. But what we don't see out of Joseph is him throwing his hands up and saying, well, I'm just a product of my raising. There's nothing I can do about it. This is just who I am. This is who my parents raised me to be. I can't fight against that. And I always encouraged young people, as I was privileged to get to teach young people forever, to take the good things in your parents and do them better, but take the bad things and filter them out. I tell my own children that. Take the good things you see from Michelle and I. Man, do them even better. But listen, I know there's things that we do that you don't like, you don't agree with. There's things we do that are sin. Take those and filter them out and, and be an even better parent than we are. Many people, though, they just say, I can't help it. This is, I just, this is who I am. I can't stop it. This is who my parents raised me to be. And I want us to see this, that no matter where you come from, No matter what you're raising, God can and will use our life for amazing things if we will just be faithful like a Joseph. So here's what I do want to read. I want to read all of chapter 37 together because I'm not going to have a chance to preach all of 37, but we really need to see all of 37 to understand what we're going to talk about next week. And then we're going to back up all the way to chapter 29 and start there because I want to start at his origin. I want to start where his dysfunction begins so that we really get a grasp of what God's going to do from this man. Genesis chapter 37 just simply says this, and Jacob, that's Joseph's father, dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought out unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. For my sheaf stood up, and all of your sheaves bowed down to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, Shall thou indeed reign over us? Or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and he told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I've dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow down ourselves unto you and to the earth? And his brothers envied him, but his father observed the saying. And his brother went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. 
And Israel, which was Jacob's name change, said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, and see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. A certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks? And the man said, Oh, they've departed from hence. I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said to one another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, let us slay him. Cast him into some pit, and we will say, Some evil beast have devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid them out of their hands, and to deliver him to his father. Again, Reuben's idea was, hey, let's just set him aside, then I'm going to save him and bring him home safe to dad. This oldest son doing the job of the oldest son, protecting his younger Verse 23, and it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread and they lifted up their eyes and looked and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh and going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brothers, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he's our brother and our flesh. Ooh, how honorable is that? And his brethren were content or complacent. They were in agreement. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted Joseph up out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. And Reuben returned under the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. And he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not... And I, whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat, and they killed a kid of the goats, and they dipped the coat in the blood, and they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent into pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, For I will go down into the grave until my, unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Let's pray. Father, as we've read your word, help us to see, God, what caused such dysfunction that would lead brothers, God, to sell their own flesh and blood into slavery. God, help us to glean uh, encouragement and strength, God, as we look into your perfect law of liberty. God, help us to shed our own dysfunctions. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Talk about a dysfunctional family. I worried about a lot of things with my sister. She's not here today, so I can talk about her. She's evil. My sister gave me my first bloody nose, hit me in the face with a tennis racket. She says it was an accident. I don't believe you. Now, my sister, me, me and my sister fought. Oh, my goodness, we fought. We fought every day of my life until I realized I could really hurt her, and then we stopped. She just fought me, and I just took it. Me and my little brother, we fought. Oh, my goodness, we had a below-the-neck rule. Brothers don't hit each other above the neck. You keep everything below the neck because... Heaven forbid mom see baby have a big bruise on his face. See, brothers and sisters, they, they fight. And it's not good, but they do, don't they? I fought my brother until the day I realized he was stronger than me and could whip me. Then I got too old for this. I matured real fast. I'm not doing this anymore, brother. You're, you know, we're, we're grown men now. We need to stop this. And I think he knows, and I know for sure it's just because he can whip me now. B brothers and sisters do fight, but... I don't think I ever worried my sister was going to kill me in my sleep. I don't think I ever worried about that. I don't think to this day my brother would cause me any legitimate harm. Matter of fact, we always had this saying in my family, that's my dog, I'll kick him if I want to, but you ain't kicking my dog. 
Me and my brother could just be throwing down in the middle of the street and one of the neighbors jump in and all of a sudden it's both of us on the neighbor because that's what family does. Family, at the end of the day, no matter how we argue and pick and fight, we love each other and we protect each other. What dysfunction led to 10 brothers saying, you know what, let's just sell this guy. I mean, we're going to kill him. We're going to kill him, but hey, man, if we just kill him, we don't make any money. What good is that? (laughs) We can be rid of him and make money. What led to that? Because it's the same household Joseph was raised in. And I want to see this, what kind of family this is. So to see this, we've got to start all the way back in Genesis 29. So let's look back in Genesis 29, and we can see that Joseph's life actually started with a dysfunctional union. And again, we do not have time to read all this. I'm going to summarize a lot of it. If you've never read this with your eyes or you haven't this year, I want you to read this today. Go home, eat lunch, read your Bible for the afternoon, get through this whole section. Because it is so telling. But from its beginning, Joseph's father, Jacob, from his birth, he's known to take advantage of his brother Esau. Right? You guys remember the story? He actually come out of the womb grasping at Esau's heel, so his name means one who trips up or a trickster. That's what Jacob means. And his whole life, he's tricking his brother, tripping his brother up. Brother comes in from the field, starving plumb to death, and he says, hey, man, I got this soup. You want some of this soup? And I'm sure his brother went, man, that smells good. Can I have some of that soup? He says, sure you can, for your birthright. Make me the oldest son. He said, man, I'm dying. If I die, it does not matter that I'm the oldest son. Fine, have my birthright. And he eats this soup. He trades away his birthright. At the end of their father's life, as as his life's coming to an end, he's going to bless his sons. And he tricks his father into giving him the blessing. Uh, I mean, he goes to great lengths to do this. He puts animal skins on him so his father will feel and feel that he's furry because he's like me. He ain't got much hair. And his brother's more like Daniel. He's got hair everywhere. And and so his his mother gives him this plan, put these skins on, I'm going to bring this meal. And he comes and he tricks his dad. He steals his brother's blessing. I mean, that's the kind of guy this is. His mama sends him away to, her, to Laban uh, to go find a wife, right? And he goes and he meets Rachel, and Rachel is beautiful. The Bible describes her uh, as being just a, a knockout. That's what it describes him as. And, and he comes to Laban, and he says, Laban, I want to marry your daughter. Because back in that time, before there was this whole incest law, by the way, we're going to get that later, but it was absolutely normal for people to marry their own family members. It was not just normal, it was encouraged. I mean, you can guarantee, who did Adam and Eve's kids marry? They had to marry their sisters because there was no other people anywhere, right? So that's just kind of how it worked. Uh, it will be in Leviticus before we see that God begins to say, hey, don't do that, wait here, stay away. But at this point, he goes to his own family's house, and he finds Rachel and says, man, Rachel is beautiful. I want to marry Rachel. And listen to what Laban does. Because you know what I'd do if, if either one of these young men that are courting my daughters came to me today and said, I want to marry them, I would be apologizing to their parents for killing them. <laughs> Hold your horses, son. Slow down. Not Laban. Laban's like, hmm, I can get something out of this. Okay, you want to marry my daughter? Work seven years, and you can have her. Seven years. Work seven for a woman? I love this. this is why I post this on Facebook. You follow me on Facebook. This is, this is one of the most beautiful things a man could say about his wife. One of the most beautiful pieces of script. Genesis 29, 20, look at it. It says, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. I love that. Listen, my wife and I have been married 20 years this year. And you know what it seems? Some days it seems like just a few days. Other times it feels like a lifetime. I don't remember what life was like without her. I don't want to know. I mean, I mean that in a good way. I don't mean like it's been miserable and it feels like it's been forever. But some days I look at her and go, man, where has the time gone? But a few days. But Laban, Laban gives uh, old, old uh, Jacob a little piece of his own medicine. If y'all read this before, he, he, he waits until the wedding night and until it's dark and no one can see him. By the way, the Bible actually describes these two girls. This is... I mean, it's God. So, but it says that Leah, his oldest daughter, is tender-eyed. That means she's a little ugly in the Hebrew. I'm not even kidding. That's really what it means. It means that she was less than attractive. Rachel's gorgeous. He slides Leah in at the last minute. Joseph, and I don't know how. I don't, I don't, I don't even want to speculate how. He didn't know, but he had consummated the marriage with the wrong woman. He gets up in the morning, and you could just imagine. He looks over and goes... He goes to Laban. He says, Laban, what have you done to me? 
Laban says, well, it's our culture. We don't ever let the younger get married before the older, so I kind of tricked you a little bit. A <laughs> little bit? And this, now, this is the Adam unstandard paraphrase version. Uh, he says, but here's what I'll do. If you want to work another seven, you can have my other daughter too. Now, just show of hands, ladies. Even if you were married by trickery, how many of you want to share your husband with another woman? Okay, at my count, that's zero. But culturally, it was never condoned by God. You don't see anything in your Bible where God says, go marry multiple women. But culturally, it's acceptable. He says, man, I'll do it, fine. He works another seven years. He gets a second wife. He gets Rachel. Do you see how dysfunctional this starts? Listen, it doesn't get better. Look at verse 30 of chapter 29. Because if you want to talk about pouring gas on a fire, take something like this and look at verse 30. And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah. Not only does he have two wives, he has one that he will openly say, I love this one more than you. This cannot end well, can it? Anything, by the way, it starts bad, has a real hard time building up well. But he has this dysfunctional beginning, this dysfunctional union. The next thing we're going to see is he not only has a dysfunctional union, he has a dysfunctional expansion. Now, what do married people do when you're young and you don't have TV to occupy your time? You start having a family. That's what you do. And that's what, that's what Jacob does. Jacob begins to have a family. Look at verse, uh, chapter 29, verses 31 and 32. 30 says he loved Rachel more. But 31... I'm in the wrong chapter. I, I jumped off. There it is. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son. She called his name Reuben. For she said, surely the Lord had looked upon my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. Notice, notice in this that God looks at this inequality between these wives. And he says, well, and this is causal. Because you hate Leah, I'm going to open her womb. Jacob, I want you to see this. You were tricked, sure. You love one more than the other, but, but I don't. I'm God. I made both of them. And I love them both. And and as my son, I expect you to love them both, but you're not. So he opens Leah's womb, and Leah has immediately, right off the bat, four children. Now listen, here's the problem. Leah says in the passage, oh, now my husband will love me. Now he'll love me because I have, I have his children. And here we see even more dysfunction that, by the way, follows us all the way into 2021. Leah, instead of appreciating the gift of a child that God gave her and her husband, and just focusing on that, immediately begins to use this child as leverage. Children are not leverage. Children are never to be used as leverage. When adults fuss, when adults have problems, when adults fight, kids should never come into the equation. Because a child only knows two things. God gave me two people who were supposed to love me all of my days. My mother and my father. And when those two don't get along, when those two want to fight, when those two want to fuss, let me tell you, here's what a kid does not do naturally. A kid naturally does not pick sides. A kid naturally does not go, okay, I hate dad now. Because, you know, because I'm on mom's side. Kids should never, should never be, and they were never intended to be battles in a weapon or weapons in a battle for affection. That's not a child's job. Kids are not meant to be leverage in court. It is not the child's job. Children are never, listen to me, never to become teammates for your side of the argument. Ever. Listen, there's dysfunction in our world. Sure, there's dysfunction in marriage. There's dysfun there's, we have all this sin in our world that just taints everything. But listen, whenever one parent takes a kid and tries to poison their mind against the other kid to use them as a weapon, let me tell you what you're doing. You're just sowing dysfunction. You're sowing it. And that's what we see all through this passage. That's what drove, by the way, that's what drove these kids to want to kill their brother. Favoritism, discord, dysfunction. Children are a gift of God that are to be nurtured and loved and raised. Let, listen, let them form their own opinions of people because it's not hard to see who people really are, is it? It's not hard. But I can tell you just from experience, my, my wife's father walked away from her uh, almost 30 years ago. Been bad to her, been ugly to her. I don't want to see the guy. 
that it's really something that I struggle with in my own spirit with the Lord is knowing I'm supposed to forgive this guy that caused such pain to this woman I love. But I promise you this, if he called her phone tomorrow and said, I'm sorry, I want to have a relationship with you, my wife, because it's built in her, would say, Dad, I love you. I want that too. You're forgiven. I promise you she would. Because it's ingrained. When we try to do anything to our children to break that, to twist that, we're fighting against nature. We're fighting against God. And we're causing and breeding dysfunction. The Lord gives Leah four sons. Reuben, the firstborn, he gets the honor. The firstborn son is the honor. How many firstborn sons we got in the room? I'm a middle kid. You know what that means? I don't matter. Now, we kind of carry that into our culture a little bit, right? The firstborn has a little more privilege, a little more responsibility. Uh, my firstborn daughter practically raised my secondborn daughter at times when we were busy and she's babysitting. Uh, she's a tremendous blessing to the house. Uh, there's more responsibility there. In Hebrew culture, it was more so. A firstborn would inherit a double portion of the inheritance from his father. That means that upon uh, Jacob's death, he would not split his inheritance into 12. He would split it into 13, and Reuben gets two. Reuben also is responsible for his brothers. You notice even in our story, it's Reuben. The one who stands to gain the most from the death of his brother, it's him that's fighting for his brother's life. And even when he's gone, you notice he said, how can I go back to dad? What am I going to do? This position of oldest, Leah gets that responsibility. She gets that privilege. She gets to have Simeon. And Simeon, Simeon's one that's going to go nuts here in just a few chapters. If I'm going to let you write. I ain't going to tell you what happened. You need to find it for yourself. But he does something really crazy. It curses his whole family line. Levi is hers, the third son. He is the priestly tribe of Israel. He is, he is honored above every other tribe. And then her, fine, her fourth son, Judah, that's the line of the kings. Remember, Jesus is the line of the tribe of Judah. He is the root of Jesse, the offspring of Jesse. This is Judah. This, this unloved wife, this unloved one that, that God opened her womb. Look at what he poured into her life. He poured in these major players in the history of Israel. She gets that honor because even though she's unloved by her husband, She's loved greatly by God. And these four children, instead of being a source of celebration for the whole dysfunctional family, just drives Rachel to jealousy. She hated Leah because Leah could have kids and she could not. What is jealousy, by the way? What is jealousy? Envy? Jealousy, listen, to, to a world that doesn't know God, jealousy is natural. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. To a person who knows God, jealousy is literally saying, God is not giving me what I deserve. I deserve what that person has. I do not trust you, Father. I'm going to go get it myself. That's what jealousy is in the life of a believer. Song of Solomon 8, 6 speaks of jealousy this way. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Jealousy does not look good on you, Christian, ever. Ever. Jealousy is just not trusting God. Rachel did not trust God, so she makes her own plan. Look here in chapter, uh, chapter 30. This is all kind of messed up. Rachel saw that she had no children. Verse 1, she had no children. Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob... Give me children or else I die. And Jacob, look, man of God, uh, in, in all of his messed upness, he says, his anger's kindled against Rachel. He said, am I in God's place? Who's withheld from you the fruit of the womb? And she said, behold, my maid Bilhah, go into her and she'll bear upon my knees that I may have children by her. And she gave him Bilhah, her handmaid, to wife. And Jacob went in to her. That is messed up. I, just when you go, okay, this cannot get any worse. Just when... Here, here's my maid. Go, go into her. And, and I love I, Jacob. Jacob, he is, he is God's man. He is one of our patriarchs of Israel. This is the guy we're supposed to look at. He's, he's where the name Israel comes from. He, he stands and he goes, no wife, I will not do that. I won't dishonor you like that. Nope, that ain't what he does at all. He goes, okay. <laughs> and he has children with his favored wife's servant. 
She has two, Dan. Dan, by the way, Dan's entire life, the tribe of Dan will struggle to trust God and they will always do things their way. How fitting is that for this mom, right? For this whole situation, Dan will carry that legacy. And Naphtali, Naphtali is the second born uh, child from this dysfunction. And listen, when we name our kids, we name them in crazy ways, right? When we named Emily... We just thought it was a beautiful name, right? It's going to be Emily. And then and Emily got her middle name from what? Mom's middle name. So we're like, oh, that's creative. And then we found out Emily was the most common name for like 10 years running. So there's Emily's everywhere. And people spell it different. I didn't know there was any other way. But then it's time to have our second child. And we're like, okay, how are we going to name this one? So this is what we did. We went, okay, maybe, and I'm going to make stuff up because I don't remember, Judith. Judith, okay, Emily and Judith. Now that doesn't go well together. Emily and Sarah. No, that doesn't really have a nice flow to it. Emily and Allie. Ooh, that sounds good. And that's really how we come up with Allison's name, is it, it flowed well when we were talking about our kid. We just thought it was beautiful. It has no meaning to it, right? It's just like, you know what? I kind of wanted to wait. She loves her. You know, in hindsight, in hindsight, I always wish I'd have named her Addison because it means child of Adam. I'm like, oh, that would have made sense. But we didn't think that way. We just thought that's a pretty name. That's how we name things. Listen, I kind of always wanted to wait till they were born and look them in the eyes and then come up with their name then. Well, you kind of look like uh, Stephanie. You know, but that, that's how we do. In Hebrew, they name their children and all the names mean something. All Hebrew names have a, a, a meaning and listen, when, when she's blessed with this second child, in her mind she's blessed with this second child from her handmaid, she can't look past her own bitterness to give it a beautiful prophetic name. Naphtali genuinely means my struggle. She, she, named, she named her kid, see, told you. That's what her kid's name is. Her name, every time she called the name would remember, all she could think about at this point is how much she hated the other wife. She can't even celebrate. Everything about this oozes dysfunction. But now Leah, Leah, because now she's jealous because she's quit having kids, and she sees that, that Rachel's wife has, or Rachel's maid has had kids, she's like, hey, I have a maid too. We can have more. Sleep with my maid too. And of course, Jacob, okay. Sometimes I look at this, and I'm like, God, this you told, you, you told Moses you were going to wipe out all of Israel for their dysfunction. And, he, and you let this happen? And this is what we have in our Bible. And God says, yeah, see, I can redeem you. I told you. <laughs> Who's past God's love, right? Anyway, she, the next servant, the next servant has two more kids. Gad and Asher, two more sons for Jacob. And listen, all this is doing, these two women are fighting they're using their kids as weapons, and all they're doing is breeding dysfunction in their family. It's all they're doing. Why? Because this isn't even about Jacob anymore. This isn't about our children. This isn't about our land. This isn't about our, our heritage. Or our, this is just, I'm going to get you, and I'm going to one-up you, and I'm going to one-up you. And I don't know, you've ever been in a one-up fight? No one ever wins a one-up fight, ever. Both of you end up far worse than you were at the beginning because it, it's the principle of it. Principle is a dumb hill to die on unless it's the principle of God. Dumb. Could it get worse? Could this possibly get any worse than what we're seeing here? It does. Look at verses 14 to 16. And Reuben, the oldest, went in the days of the harvest and found mandrakes in the field. And he brought them unto his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Give me, I pray you, some of your son's mandrakes. And she said unto her, Is it a small matter that you've taken my husband? And would thou take away my son Mandrakes also? And Rachel said, Therefore, he can lie with you tonight for the Mandrakes. Oh, my word. And Jacob came out of the field in the evening, and Rachel went out to meet him and said, You must come with me, for surely I've bought you with my son's Mandrakes. That's pathetic. This is taking something that God said is supposed to be lovely. Something God said is supposed to be divine. Intimacy between a man and a woman. It is a gift from God pre-fall. There's nothing sinful about it in the covenant of marriage. It is a beautiful thing and they are treating it so cheaply. 
As if somehow it's something to be bargained with or bartered with. Hey, if you give me some mandrakes, you, you can have the husband tonight. He, he can be all yours. And you go, really, you think so little of your husband that you would trade him for a plant? My wife might trade me for a lot of things. A new car. A younger, stronger model. You know, this one's got a few miles on it. Some that's got a little less cargo space. I don't know, but here's what she wouldn't. She ain't going to trade me for a sweet potato. I'm pretty confident in that. I, I feel pretty confident she ain't going to. Maybe a good steak, but not pasta. You know, ain't going to happen. She's trading her husband for something that can be found in nature. She's trading him. Listen, listen, listen. We laugh a little bit about that, but can, can't you see where this could cause problems? When we start taking intimacy and making it a bargaining chip. Can't you see this? Listen, does this not play out in households in America, even in Christian marriages today? When intimacy becomes a tool of manipulation and bargaining and bartering? See, that's why 1 Corinthians 7, I mean, it's, it's clear. 1 Corinthians 7, 4 just reminds us, listen, the wife doesn't have power over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also, the husband has not power over his own body, but the wife does. It's literally a reminder of this, is when your partner is desiring intimacy, we have no right to tell them no. We have no right to make it a bargaining chip. We have no right to withhold it for any reason, to, to somehow manipulate circumstance. Or, listen, it's not for that. That's not what it is. It's a gift God gave us, and he says, treat it properly she's trading this and using this to, to manipulate God and out of it she gets two more sons <laughs> I love how God takes her wickedness and he's just like all right blessing <laughs> yeah you're being dumb blessing Leah the unfavored wife gets to be the honored mother of half of the tribes of Israel the other three women together make up the other six God blesses this one that was so poorly treated. God ridiculously blesses this one that was so unloved. We can look into this craziness and think, man, it's a miracle anyone can make it out of that household sane. And I'd agree with them. Listen, I, I'm getting, getting to minister to kids, if, if nothing else, it taught me this. Parents are often the most damaging aspect of their child's life. Because kids grow up in such dysfunction, they don't know which way to turn. They don't know which way is up or down. They don't know what's right and wrong because all they've seen in their own home is this dysfunction. And listen, you, you, you hear it in their tones. I can't help it. That's just how I was raised. And listen, just when you think this dysfunction can't get any worse, let's sprinkle in a little favoritism. Let's just, let's just sprinkle this in on top. Let's, if, if you were going to make the perfect storm soup of a, par, of, a, of a family, this is how you do it. Look at verses 30, 22, 24. Finally, God remembers Rachel. God remembers Rachel. God hearkened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph. And said, the Lord shall add to me another son. Finally, finally, Joseph is born. Finally, Rachel has a son. But look in chapter 37. This is where we get to skip ahead. Lots of verses. We read this together earlier. And this is where it becomes problematic. Verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Finally, after all this drama, after all this mess, a son is born from this wife that was the favorite wife. Now, that's bad enough to have, to have favorites in that kind of relationship. But let's just make it worse. Now, now he has this younger son, and he is openly and unashamedly telling everyone, this kid is my favorite kid. Now listen, I know I'm my, my parents' favorite. I know it. It's, it's undisputable. But my dad wouldn't say that out loud. He would never shatter my siblings like that. No, my dad doesn't have favorites. You know why? All of his kids are his favorite. He does that to the point of, to the point of nausea. Hi, my favorite oldest grandchild. 
Hi, my favorite second oldest grandchild. Hi, my favorite oldest grandchild of my first daughter. Dad, everyone's dad's favorite, but you know what? I have favorites. My kids will tell you I have favorite. My favorite kid is whoever brought me coffee last. So it's up for grabs. You want to be my favorite kid? Bring me coffee. You're my favorite. Emily brought me coffee. I was working the other day. I was frustrated. Mine's all just packed full of everything. And out the blue, I hear the voice of an angel. Daddy. But she didn't have it in her hand. I understand. Y'all battle it out for favorite. I get it. Daddy, I brought you coffee. Ooh, my whole day turned around. Listen, my, kid, my kids know this. Both my kids are wonderfully unique. They are so different. They are night and day. They are, they, they have, they each have just tremendous qualities God gave them both. And you know what? I couldn't have a favorite if I wanted to. Why? It's apples and oranges. They're so different. But you know what? They're both wonderfully different. See, I'm blessed to have both of them. I need them both, by the way. Just to balance my family out, I need them both. Emily, Emily has just this tremendously graceful heart. Uh, her whole life, she's been a doormat. She don't care who walks all over her. She just loves you. She'll just forgive you. I wish I could be like that more. Allie, Allie has a spine. Allie's not only going to not let you walk over, she ain't going to let you step near her. But she's going to do it in love and grace. See, I need some more of that too. I need, I need a little of both. Both of them ridiculously loyal to their friends to a fault. Both of them. Listen, do they both got traits that God needs to tweak out of them? Yeah, don't we all? But I can't have a favorite. They're both my favorite. I, I need them both. They're both my, my princesses. I want them both to have the desires of their heart. I want them both to follow God. I want him to bless them like he's never blessed anyone else. I pray this over them. But having an open favorite is damaging to the self-esteem of your children, to their relationships with their, each other, and it just breeds contention between them. See, at one time, I was actually told that Allie thought that Emily really was my favorite. And that broke my heart. It actually made me actively concentrate on working on making sure she knows that's not true. Because I know if she believes this, it will hurt her. Because it's not true. But if she believes it's true, it will damage her in her raising. So I work hard to make sure Allie knows I do not have a favorite. I love you both, and I love you both wonderfully. Actually, I have a favorite, but it's Mama. Mama's my favorite. No, she's not my kid, Allie. Did you hear that? That's that spunk. Listen, here's the problem. When we, when we teach all of our kids that they're all loved and they all have a place and they all fit in, it gives them room to explore their natural gifts and their natural talents and to flourish. But when we begin to say, I like this one better than this one, it makes them doubt themselves, makes them hate themselves, makes them hate their siblings and hate you. Having a favorite is just damaging. But look, where did Jacob come up with this idea? Where did Jacob think it was okay to say, I have a favorite? Well, it comes all the way back from his daddy in Genesis 25. Genesis 25 is just clear. The boys grew, Esau and Jacob. Esau is a cunning hunter, a man of the field. He's a man's man. But Jacob, now he's a plain man. He, he, he's, a little, he's a little soft. He's a little tender. Isaac loved Esau. He loved his man's man. But mama, mama loved Jacob. And there was this contention. Each parent had a favorite child and they battled against each other. So where did, ja where did Jacob come up with it? That's just the way he was raised. He's just following his raising. And it's because of all that we see this, defunct, this dysfunctional deception. It's because of all that. That when God blessed Jacob with these dreams, hey, listen, your brothers and your mother and your father are going to bow down to you. Does that happen? Oh, yeah, it happens. Well, father does. Mother passes away before she ever has a chance to fulfill it. But instead of going, God, what, what exactly is it that you're trying to tell me here? Instead of, they hated him for it. How dare you dream that dream? Look, dad already thinks you're the favorite. Your mom's already the favorite wife. And now you're going to be the king over us? I don't think so. When this dreamer comes out to the field, we're going to chuck him in a pit and sell him off as a slave. Listen, all of that dysfunctionality, all of that in these boys' life, let me just put the blame exactly where it belongs, right at the feet of their parents. 
the battles they started, the fights they had, the, the insecurity they bred, this favoritism they showed. It grew into their sons, and because it grew into their sons, their sons just did according to their raising. They chucked them in a pit and sold them as a slave. But could we expect anything less from these boys? I don't think so. I think they did exactly what they were taught to do. Love is a bargaining chip. Relationships are, are fickle. They don't really matter. And you know what? This will advance us if we get rid of him. So you know what we're going to do? We're just going to get rid of him. See, that's what makes the story of Joseph so inspiring. That Joseph, who's raised in the same household with these same parents and these same brothers, dealing with the same fallout, grows to be such a remarkable man of God. See, as we investigate his life over these next three weeks, the one thing we're going to notice, in every situation, he stands tall. In every situation, he says, I cannot sin against my God. In every situation, he gives glory to God. Pharaoh is going to bring him up to interpret a dream. He's going to say, man, I've heard you can interpret dreams. And where he could say, yes, I can. He says, I can't do anything, but my God can. Joseph, incredible man, out of this dysfunction. Listen, every hero in our Bible is tainted, aren't they? I love that about our Bible. Adam and Eve, first man, first woman. God's like, yeah, but they ate the fruit. Abraham, Abraham took his wife, Sarah. She's beautiful. He took her in twice. He tells the king, oh, hey, tell him you're my sister so he don't kill me. And the king took his wife into his house and God spared her. This kind of a, 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 a coward from Abraham. Isaac, by the way, Jacob's father, he does the same thing to his wife. He does the exact same thing with King Abimelech. Job, we brag on Job's faithfulness, right? Man, Job, and all of this, he, he did not curse God. He, he just dealt with it. But you remember, God had to correct even Job. Job, you think too much of yourself. You think too highly of yourself, Job. He had to correct him. David cheats with Bathsheba. Peter denied Christ at the crucifixion. Thomas doubted the resurrection. Paul killed Christians. Every hero we have in the Bible is recorded some giant failure except for Joseph. No failure with Joseph. No bad word about Joseph. See, as we read the story of Joseph, we think he's got more reason than anyone else we read to be messed up. But I want us to see this. God redeemed his life. Even though it was messed up from before he was in the womb, he redeemed him out of such dysfunction that a great hero was birthed. And that tells us this today. One, parenting is hard. Parenting is hard, and many of us, if you've got teenage children, if you're to that point, maybe even before, you have regrets for mistakes you made raising your kids. Sometimes you watch the decision you make, and you go, is that my fault? Is that because of what I taught them, didn't teach them, showed them, didn't show them? But this, this reminds us, as we read Joseph's life, God is more than capable of repairing our mistakes in the lives of our children. But it's up to our children to make the decision to follow him. No one gets to just say, I'm just a product of my raising. No one. Because the minute we gave our life to Christ, he says, all things just became new. Even your raising. It's off the table. Sure, it's our job to train up our children in the way they should go. And listen, if you've got children in the house, you have a great responsibility. It's up to you to make sure they know God's word and to know that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. It's up to you. But when we make our mistakes, or maybe, maybe you came to faith once your kids was already raised. And you look at their mess of a life and you go, that's all my fault. Take heart, Christian. God can overcome our mistakes. God can redeem anyone. His blood, the blood of Christ is powerful enough. And that's freeing today. Second thing, it tells us this. If he can re redeem a Joseph, we don't have any excuse to surrender to our raising. None. No excuse. You can help it. Absolutely. The Word of God says so. You do not have to repeat the mistakes of your parents. The Word of God says so. You, are, you were created for more and God loves you more. Mark chapter 5, one of my heroes of the faith is this maniac of Gadara. He's laying in the tombs naked, cutting himself. They would chain him in the graveyard because they didn't want him in the town. And the Bible says he was so overwhelmed with demons he could break the chains. No one wanted to be around this guy. Jesus shows up and he runs to Jesus. Jesus casts out a legion, a legion of demons. Freeing this man from everything that tormented him. Mark 5.15, listen to these words. When they came, when the townspeople came to see Jesus and to see him that was possessed of the devil, 
the one who had the legion, they found him sitting down, fully clothed, and in his right mind. Listen, we all had reason to be dysfunctional. We all, uh, we all grew up in dysfunctional families in one way or another. But the power of the gospel, the power of grace is this. No matter who you are before, no matter what you came from before, no matter what you were taught, if anybody in the world had an excuse to be a sociopathic serial killer, it's Joseph. But the power of God is greater. Let us never, as Christians, ever utter these words. I can't help it. It's just how I was raised. Let's bow for prayer today. The greatest testimony a parent has, especially a parent that came to faith late, or a parent that matured in their faith late, is to just show our kids the change that's possible. See, the story of Joseph, it's, it's inspiring throughout his life. But today, let his story inspire real freedom from our family traits, from our raising that tempts us to sin, from our excuses. Let his story encourage us that God can forgive all of our mistakes. Even the ones we made raising our children. Because he's calling them at this very moment to more. Just as he's calling you to more. If they'll just answer the call. Let your children see how Jesus has changed you. Let them see that he can change them. We are not forced to live the life that we were taught by our parents. We are free today to live the life that was bought by Jesus on the cross for us. I just ask you today if, if you've been caught in that trap, I can't help it. This is just who I am. I can't stop it. I just encourage you right now, just call out to God. God, I can help it. Because you've given me the ability. You've called me to greater. Listen, believer, I hope that we take all the great things our parents have taught us. And, and we make much of that. But I hope that we're wise enough and discerning enough to see the mistakes our parents made. And to not repeat those. I pray that my children don't repeat my mistakes. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ. You can't help it because you don't have the power to help it. The sinless son of God took on flesh. Hung on a cross. Gave his life so that you could be saved. If right now you would just trust him by faith. If you don't know Christ, would you just call out on him today? God, I love you. Thank you for sending Jesus for me. Thank you that his blood can forgive me. Right now, God, take all I am and save me. Today I trust Jesus as my Savior and Lord. If you can pray that in Jesus' name, His promises, He'll save you. He'll save you. He can change your whole legacy today in a moment. If we'll trust Him. Father, it's in the name of Christ that we come to you, God, and we do pray for this correcting work in our lives. God, that you would make great witnesses out of dis dysfunctional families. God, that you would clear out the, the mistakes and clear out the, the, the assumptions, God, that we carry. Our excuses, Father, clear them out. God, let us stand strong for you. God, if a man like Joseph can come out of that family 
and be the redeemer of Israel, be the savior of his people, then Father, what great things could you do with us despite how we were raised, despite the legacy we carry? God, I pray for our church family that no one here would think less of themselves because of where they're from, God, the family they come from. Father, their past mistakes. But God, help us to walk in the truth that you can forgive all things. And that God, when you forgive all things, they are cleansed and they are gone. And God, we do not have to be a slave to anything but you today. God, let us stand in uncertain times. Let us boldly proclaim your name to those around us, Father. God, use us as your people. Hold us in your care. God, we love you. We trust you for all these things. God, we pray that even now you'd be blessing Miss Linda's mama, Stephen's grandson. God, that you would, God, just show yourself great. Father, bless the offering that we'll take as we leave. Use it for the upbuilding of your kingdom, God. Thank you, Father, for giving us this morning with your word. We're not promised tomorrow. So, God, let us be thankful for today. Bless us and keep us till we return again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, don't forget, we're returning to normal services on Wednesday. Big, exciting stuff. I don't know who's supposed to be doing dinner Wednesday. I know someone knows, and if they don't, let me know. All right. Good deal. Uh, Really excited to be praying. Be praying for our children. Nothing in their world's been normal for weeks and weeks and weeks. So pray that this week God will remind them just how much we love them and we want them with us. Guys, God bless you. Have a great and a godly week.